Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Worthy. I'm the Virtual Conference Director of, of, of IORMA. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, session on how I, AI is uh, enhancing personal development. Uh, just a few minutes, uh, bits of housekeeping, if I, if I may. Uh, if you have any questions, please would you try to use the Q&A box for asking questions rather than the, 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 the chat uh, box? Um, we have a wonderful uh, a panel of experts, uh, but before I, ha I hand over to them, I just want to say just a few words about IOMA. Um, so the IOMA Consumer Commerce Centre is a, it's a neutral resource for businesses and government that recognise the need to understand and respond to the ways in which um, uh, the 7.8 billion global consumers are changing and in the products and services that they want and need, the ways they want to obtain them. Um, and these changes are happening globally, driven by developments in society, in business and in technology. And, and this webinar is one of a series of thought leadership discussions held typically every other Thursday, although this is the first one in 2022. And topics are chosen from IOMA's horizon scanning, its surveys and its research. So um, before um, I uh, hand over to Dr. Julie Wall, who's our expert moderator, I would like to just launch a, a poll and ask you to let me know um, whether you previously, personally, or your organization used online development programs. Um, and if you have, um, whether you found them to be successful. Uh, so the poll should be launched now. It should be available on your screen. Uh, I would just ask you to uh, give your responses. I can see some answers coming in now. So what you should be seeing on the screen are the results of the poll, um, which basically are, are pretty much split 50-50 uh, in terms of uh, the answers. Uh, so now, um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Julie Wall, um, who's our expert um, uh, moderator. Julie. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for joining this webinar on the topic of how AI is enhancing personal development. Um, over the past couple of years with the pandemic, the lockdowns and working from home, these have all changed how we individuals and societies think and act. Um, and as a result of this, personal development has become more important um, for one's career, cognitive health, or just pleasure really. So every person is different when it comes to this. Every person has a different style of how he or she learns and processes new information. But learning is likely to be more effective if these preferences are actually taken into account. Um, artificial intelligence allows learning to be personalized. Um, it allows it to be personalized by adapting to the needs of each learner, whether it be by means of encouragement, um, the speed of delivery, or even the different types of media that can be used. So today we have assembled experts in this area, and these are experts who design the learning platforms. And we will discuss the benefits that AI poses for personal development, and we will talk about the challenges ahead for those who both train and educate. Um, I'd like to move on to introduce myself and our excellent panelists. So my name is Dr. Julie Wall. I'm a reader in computer science and director for impact and innovation at the University of East London. Um, personally, I work on I'm interested in research in deep learning, applications of deep learning, um, natural language processing, and natural language understanding. Um, so for our panelists, our first panelist is Callum Denyer, co-founder and CEO of Wineless Limited. Callum, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Hi, yes, thanks, Judy, and hi, everybody. Um, yes, I'm Callum Denyer, co-founder and CEO of Wineless. We are actually working in partnership with the University of East London on a Innovate UK grant funded project. If you don't know what Innovate UK is, it's the UK grant funding body. Um, very fortunate to be working with, with Dr. Mohammed and Judy on this project. Um, my interest in this topic, I think actually comes from my own experience, having left the corporate world, trying to work out my own path, my own career, and kind of going on that personal development journey. I realized that the, the tools in the market aren't quite sufficient and quite accessible to most people. So 
my mission and our mission at Wineins is to help people find fulfillment in their work and their lives by um, providing more accessible services that help people in the personal development journey. Excellent, thank you, Carl. Uh, our next panelist is Dario Dupriu, co-founder of Captica and CEO for Human and Machine Limited. Dario, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jenny. So, hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Uh, so, my name is Dario, and my background is in human-computer interaction. And I spent more or less 20 years working uh, in technology and uh, product development for software and technology company. Uh, basically, I've worked in, I spent a lot of time in corporate world, and I've worked in startup, uh, made some successful one, and then I moved into consultancy. I set up my own company, Human and Machine, as you say. And more recently, I start uh, operating uh, as, as a coach, as executive coach and supporting uh, person around the clients around the world about personal development. And what I suddenly came to the conclusion is that uh, I was missing a way to analyze uh, my client's progress and my progress around that. And that's why together with my, my colleague, Maddie, we decided to found Captica. That uh, is nothing more that uh, uh, we try basically to, to pave new understanding in the personal development and we leverage AI to do this one. Basically, we do this one with a platform that just analyzes real-time dialogue between the coach and the coachee, who is the client, in one-to-one -one or multiple team session. And we provide basically speech-to-text, summarization, and computer, computational analysis dialogue around that one. So the, the goal specifically we try to solve is how we can improve effective, effectiveness in coaching intervention. We have some use case already, so we've been starting using and uh, piloting our product with coach supervisor, with trainee, with HR and learning and development function inside, inside company. So we are in the, in the piloting phase at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. Next, I'm very pleased to introduce Debbie Colley, uh, co-founder and chief executive officer of i3 Simulations. Debbie, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Really pleased to be here. I'm Debbie Colley. I'm co-founder and CEO of i3 Simulations. We are a deep tech company offering medical training simulations, uh, which are in fact, not only immersive and interactive, but actually intelligent. We use the power of machine learning and um, advanced extended reality technologies to be able to provide personalized and adaptive simulations. So in, in a way that can be quite complementary to what's already out there as an existing offering, or in some cases, uh, it can potentially even replace an existing offering. And what we do here is we not only use the benefits and advantages of AI and machine learning on the back end of uh, analyzing the trainee data, but we actually take that data and complete the loop by being able to provide adaptive simulations so that it's far more personalized to the um, end users. Thankfully, we have been, um, our first program in healthcare have been funded by uh, seed funding of that came through from Facebook. So we, but we are platform agnostic. We're not necessarily, it's a disclaimer, not necessarily married to any particular um, hardware vendor out there. However, that led us uh, the, the pathway to get today into 80 plus global hospitals with our adaptive training simulation. So we're very pleased to be here to share some of our journey and the knowledge within this platform making. Fantastic, thank you, Debbie. And our final panelist is um, Mohammed Hossein Amir Hosseini, my esteemed colleague and lecturer in computer science and digital technologies from the University of East London. Mohammed, would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Mohammed Hussein Amir Husseini. Uh, I'm a lecturer in computer science and digital technologies at the University of East London. Uh, my expertise and research interest is uh, application of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in different disciplines, especially psychology, mental health, and personal development. Uh, I've also used uh, AI and machine learning uh, in other fields uh, such as cybersecurity, uh, identity resolution, and social media analysis. Uh, so recently I've been working on uh, an Innovate UK funded project 
uh, with uh, Wines Company, with Callum, uh, which is the, the project is related to personal development. And yeah, that's all about me. Excellent, thank you, Mohammed. Okay, so let's kick off with our questions. Please note that as a participant, you can write questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen throughout the webinar. And towards the last 15 minutes, we will go through as many of your questions as we can um, at the end. Okay, I guess the underlying technology around that you're all using is some form of artificial intelligence. And um, AI is said to enhance personal development. So what aspect makes it most effective? Mohammed, you were last to speak. Shall we go back to you? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, well, first of all, we should know that we are talking about weak AI, which is accessible and uh, can be used to automate routine processes. Strong AI is for experimental projects and uh, cannot be easily accessible because of different reasons. Existing infrastructure resources, which are required and ethical issues which need to be addressed properly. So considering this point, in personal development, the first important thing that AI can help with is increasing your self-awareness. Uh, and an AI-powered system can help you to understand your preferred learning style, your preferred representational system, the way that you can learn and understand things better, the way that you can have a more efficient communication with other people, for instance. Another thing that AI can help with is uh, to provide personalized learning experience, as Julie mentioned in the beginning. So using AI and machine learning models, which have the power to recognize many individual learning patterns can help you to find out which type of learning experience or uh, object gives the best result for individual learners. Uh, for instance, in an organization, each employee will have a preferred learning style and learn most effectively using a specific method. This could be through video tutorials, written content, in-person training, audio guided presentations, or something else. So an AI powered training program allows the training program to be adoptive, where the uh, modules are modified to suit the needs of uh, each employee, for instance, or the elements might offer video tutorials to certain employees, but um, also uh, transcribe the, the, the video to text-based articles for other employees, for instance. So the time is safe, engagement is encouraged, the learning process is automated. Uh, another thing that uh, um, um, is uh, uh, integrating training into the routine workflow. Uh, so uh, most of the learners are not satisfied either with the you know, schedule of training or the format of information delivery. Uh, so a learning system powered with artificial intelligence is a good solution to this problem. The all powered learning system will provide uh, a program, materials and schedules that are personally developed for uh, each employee. AI can also be used for uh, uh, reinforcing training and development and improving completion rates for training programs. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it can uh, provide a better accessibility. So AI products makes training programs uh, reachable to a wide group of learners, including people with different type of disabilities, for instance. For example, uh, Google presented uh, an automatic uh, uh, captions video application, uh, I think in 2009, uh, which, could, uh, which could help deaf people. So besides the, the application uh, was uh, equipped with auto translation functionality that helps people enjoy uh, watching videos in more than you know, 50 different languages. Uh, moreover, it can be used for uh, measuring, learning and training effectiveness. So using AI systems, you can collect and analyze data quickly to get certain insights on learning effectiveness. So the insights point out learners' progress and emphasize learners' knowledge gap, for instance. So um, on the other hand, it can be used for creating uh, digital training content. So you can use a well-trained AI system and learning content can be automatically created or sourced from the internet. So the AI system then, uh, it can cross the web for research papers on a specific topic that, for instance, in an organization the employee is looking for and provides relevant insights from these papers to help the learner understand the process. So uh, uh, finally, on the other hand, I think uh, AI can be um, um, a reliable assistant for a coach as it can help the coach to make sure that the coaching session is going on in the right direction 
and the coaching model is delivered in a high quality. So it can also help the coach to have a better time management during the coaching sessions. So uh, these are some of the points that I think uh, AI can be helpful in, for, and can be used for enhancing the personal development and learning process for uh, individual and especially in organizations for uh, employee. So there are other points, but I think uh, it's better to keep it short and uh, uh, you know, as the time is limited. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And I'm sure we will dig down into some of those topics that you mentioned um, during this um, round table. If we are looking at it from the coaching point of view, Dario, what do you think is the most effective part? Yeah, so I would, I think uh, Moed has done a great description of opportunity around AI and personal development. Uh, for me, it's, um, I think it's, uh, what are the personal development skills? What are we talking about here? So for me, personal development skills are around communication, problem solving, self-confidence, adaptability, leadership, emotional intelligence. And, and if we think about how we grow this skill, how we've been growing this skill, we've been learning so far that they continuously require intervention. It is a continuous intervention. And it's an intervention that is done on the job in real life. So it's done with uh, reading, with feedback, with observation of what's going on around you, with the reflection of the person. Just keep it reflecting on what's happening and what is done. It's done with journaling. Someone used meditation around that one. And someone, as Moira mentioned, is, is using coaching and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and some uh, mentoring around helping continuously on the job in real life learning. And so it's, I think it's our brain is perfect for this. Our brain is, is a beautiful machine because it's, it's super efficient. I mean, it's, uh, it's capable of analyzing a lot of information in real time, consuming very little amount of energy. The problem here is that it's not effective at scale because uh, the brain is work on <laughs> on one specific person at the time. It doesn't work at scale. And when he has to work at more scale, what he does his brain is create oversimplified model of reality. So we create just very simple oversimplified model. Of reality. We work with bias and we, we are able to analyze a scale, but with our perception of reality. And that doesn't work too. So, so that's, that's where I think AI, it's, it's massively usable. And what, that's why AI is complementary to our brain in order to support personal development. Because, because and, and the beautiful and what's happening right now is that we, we know that personal development is complex. We know that it requires real-time feedback, because it requires contest awareness, personalization, and, and especially it requires expert knowledge. We require, if we wanna deliver personal development product, we need expert. It's not can be, we use uh, Amazon mechanical trunk with tons of people around the world that support, we require app, experts. And, we are, and, and so we learn that automation is not enough to scale personal development. We need something more. And, and so to scale personal development at reduced cost, that's where AI is coming into. Because a, automation is not able to, cannot do it. And so really what, uh, what we are seeing is that AI enabled to scale personalization is, is enabled to analyze huge data set and extract pattern that uh, are based on real statistical evidence. So it's, uh, it's kind of complementing or enable us to move away from our bias when we deliver personal development program at scale. Uh, so what, what I see is that we are seeing new personal development pathway emerging. And uh, Mohamed has been great on, 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 uh, on highlighted all uh, the opportunity and scenario there, starting from personalization in plan and content delivery to augmented tutoring and supervision to analytic and insights. So, so I think that, and there are huge opportunities there in, in this new pathway of learning personal development, of, of delivering personal development program. Uh, one thing uh, who, who makes me even thinking more that is effective is it's just based on on number on uh, on on GDPR and uh, 
and, uh, and economics who are just basically a proxy of our reality. And, and, and I was looking just before this conference as, as PricewaterhouseCooper has, Price Waterhouse Cooper has done, done a used research, of, research on impact on AI. And uh, they, they came out with an estimation that 14% uh, increase of GDPR will become uh, from AI in 2013. We're talking about uh, a good amount of trillion. We're talking about 15 trillion across all sector here, across mm -hmm. the world. Uh, and if we consider lender and developer, lender and developer at the moment, it's, it's a big part of the GDPR. And uh, we can estimate that probably nearly a trillion dollars will come from, we will arrive at $1 trillion thanks to the support and, uh, and the benefit of artificial intelligence. So there is, there is a huge market potential in terms of economic, but I think economic, economic is just a, a proxy who show the benefit and the value who will, who will give to the customer at the end of the people, the society. Okay, thank you, um, Dario. Well, there's one interesting thing I thought I'd like to focus in on. You were talking about how we can scale up from the individual aspect of AI. Um, so, Devi, do you think it's important that we need to know about a learner's past performances and their learning preferences and objectives? Is that important for an AI driven program? Yeah, um, I think that's interesting because uh, from from where we as a I3 team look at it, we don't really see this as a choice anymore to organizations. Uh, only because I think the advancements of AI, uh, whether it's machine learning, data science, it is so at its optimum levels that it's almost essential for every organization to consider to tr start tracking this um, trainee perform past performances and every aspect of the trainee data. And I think, if anything, uh, we see that to be uh, the most crucial part of any product making as far as training and develop personal development is concerned. Um, certainly, as um, the, um, Dario was mentioning earlier about this continuous intervention, and I think it's such an important part uh, of personal development, whether it's um, uh, you know, enterprise training or even individual personal development based training, it's very important to have every aspect of the data monitored uh, based on past performances and be able to make those recommendations. Because um, for instance, uh, we at I3, uh, we, we deal with medical training simulations and certainly in areas of uh, emergency and trauma, it becomes so much more important for the medical professionals to build their muscle memory, build their self-confidence, to make those critical decisions in, in those critical movements uh, of, uh, of their uh, profession. And uh, this particular emphasis of uh, training cannot be provided if we cannot track every aspect of their data when they are um, uh, going through that program. So what we do, like I mentioned earlier, is actually use the benefits of AI. And uh, we, we build both the front end aspect and the back end aspect. And the back end aspect is, is everything that AI is capable to do as far as the data analytics and uh, gathering is concerned. But uh, what we are using with uh, doing with that data is actually we're now able to provide um, adaptiveness in the simulation by by offering a contextual challenges or contextual support that is that continuous intervention, because that's really one of the great useful features of AI. And that particularly in our use case with medical simulations is, is extremely powerful because uh, especially no two patients uh, exhibit or respond the same way uh, or present the same symptoms um, or behaviors and no two uh, medical professionals or trainees would learn the same way. So what are we trying to do by giving a very scripted narrative training? That's not gonna work. I mean, what we are trying to do here at I3 Simulations is actually build in an adaptive uh, a model that's not just limited to sort of a scripted narrative uh, offering. Um, okay. So it's far more effective in that sense, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Callum, you know, your background is around creating technologies that kind of empower people. Um, how does this kind of using people's attributes and data and history 
actually how important is that yeah i think i think it's very important in terms of advancing the human race in in, in some senses you know i think there is an inherent ethical risk you know in terms of the dependencies that we put on these technologies and the responsible adoption of them but equally i think given where we are as a society actually we need technology to be able to actually prepare and equip our brains to have the resilience and the toughness and you know the actual the performance to operate in the world that we live in right now um technology moves so quick and you know it's only moving faster and faster and actually if we if we don't use it in a responsible way to actually enhance our own brains and you know complement the skills that we do have do have actually you know, we could we could end up being in a dangerous position we could end up you know being um not having the resilience and the kind of actual tools and our, our own personal armies to actually face that world and, and to live in it um but i do think there's there is some big ethical questions right, with that the, the, um we all need to be very responsible with you know, especially the people that work in in this space um broadly speaking i think technology you know inherently is moving way faster than humans can evolve fundamentally we can't evolve generationally as quickly as as computers do so we've seen um how, how quickly that's happening um and i think there is a there is a risk inherently that we just kind of assume that we want to use technology as much as possible because it's going to be good for our lives but actually there are very many unintended consequences that can happen from these technologies if we aren't responsible with them um so you know just as, as a broad comment i think that that they are very important but actually only if they're using them in a responsible way yeah very very important issue the ethics issue and ethics comes up in so many different types of conversations around when AI is brought into the equation. Um, Dario, what are your thoughts on, you know, we have this in-depth personalized consumer data and it's something that corporations will be very keen to get their hands on. How do you think we can alleviate concerns of, you know, our customers or the, the actual end users around this issue? Well, it's, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good one. And, and I think it's, uh, everybody's concerned about it. <laughs> And, uh, but I think it's, uh, I've been thinking this, this is not something new. It's not really something new. I mean, I was thinking during the second world war in 1943, the Allies were trying to destroy their civil registry in Amsterdam because it was, they were, they were basically having all the information on the Jewish population in one single location. And that was a massive risk. And so the Allies the ally tried to, before the Nazi arrived, to, to take all the information to discover where they were the, the Jewish in, in, in Netherlands, they arrived and the Allies were, were bombing the, the civil register in order to don't make a, this data available and accessible. They managed to destroy only 15% of the, of the data, of the records, and then 5 million records were available. And so there is huge risk in centralizing the information, but there are, we know the benefit also, the, the effectiveness, how ef more efficient we are and whatever. So as, as you say, there is this risk. I'm not, I'm not comparing cooperation to Nazi. I'm far away from doing that, but there, there, is, there, is, there is a risk in centralizing the information. And how, what, how we can avoid this? And uh, there are different levels of how we can avoid this. And I think what, what we are doing, for example, inside of Ketika, we are making sure that uh, the access is secure. So there is the data, there is, there is encryption in the data. Then we are transparent with the customer. So the customer know exactly what we use the data for, who is using the data. We are registered with ICO. And, and we try to really make awareness in the customer about the data. We try also to, and we're gonna try even more and more to anonymize this data. So, and, and it's possible, you can change frequency. For example, we record audio of the session and who are the personal identifiable information. And you can anonymize, for example, this data, change the frequency, but also anonymize 
information that uh, the client or the coach say during the session. But I think this one is, uh, is one side. I think that the huge uh, change is in the decentralization. So, because the huge risk is in centralized information <laughs> under one single server, under one single location. And <laughs> even if you are very, very group and anonymizing uh, and very transparent, there is still the risk because it's one single source where you can get all this information. And, and I think we are seeing now, nowadays, how different team and different technology are enabling to decentralize this one. So on one side, one opportunity is to run model on, on your server. And so don't use third-party API, avoid to use central, but this is, of course, is require more effort. And the other thing is uh, it's, uh, basically on, on the web 3.0. We see more and more uh, solution connecting AI with blockchain, for example. And so the, the user, the customer has his own decryption key on his own local machine. Maybe it requires to be a bit more tech savvy. Maybe it requires to have uh, to make sure that you don't lose the key and, and your, your decryption key. But at the same time, the benefits are huge. The benefit is that uh, no one can access that, that, that the huge database. You, you own that part mm -hmm. you, uh, on the set. So, and we see different projects. I mean, Singularity AI works on, on AI, on blockchain. We see also personal development projects uh, that, uh, that are running the model on your local mobile phone, for example. And, and so, it's, uh, it's really how can we make sure that the information are not in one single point because no system is, uh, is secure 100%. And I've, what I think is that the only way to secure the 100% is, is, is not secure 100% one single system, is have many systems, many way. Okay. That, that's, that's reduce the risk, usually. Well, Callum, going back to you, you know, you were brought up the ethical point of view. You know, following on from what Dario has said, when we look at the more practical points of view around data hacking and, you know, do you have any additional thoughts on uh, security considerations around collecting, using and storing of personal data from uh, maybe not the big corporations, but maybe the companies who are actually, you know, developing these types of applications? Yeah, and uh, I agree with Dario on the Web 3.0 and the kind of decentralization of this information, my background um, in my previous career was, you know, I specialize in decentralized digital identity, so um, blockchain based digital identity solutions. And for those people kind of listening that still, blockchain is still a bit of a mystery, and you know, the application to digital identity, especially, um, essentially, the way that a decentralized blockchain based identity solution works is that none of your personal information is stored on the blockchain. Everyone on the kind of edge of this chain holds information locally, if you want to call it that. Um, and the only thing that the blockchain is used for is for pairwise exchanges of sets of encryption keys, as Daria mentioned, so that you can have secure connections with individual people and so that you can verify the source of specific information. So it means, as a simple example, if I'm going, out to a bar. I mean, I don't get ID at bars anymore, unfortunately. But if I was 10 years younger and I was being ID'd um, at a bar, whereas now I have to give my driving license over, they might take a copy of it, they keep all that, you know, and it's got my name, my, my home address, and it's got all this peripheral information on it. But all they need to know is my age. Actually, they don't even need to know my age, they only need to know that I'm over 18. Um, in a decentralized identity world, all they would need to do is verify with me that I had a trusted credential to say that I'm over 18 that had been verified by someone else. There'll be no way that I could provide that with them. And they just use a blockchain to check the veracity of that, of that credential. So you can start to see actually that in that kind of situation, I'm in control of my data. I'm explicitly sharing at every single point who sees my information because the information is only hold, held by me and all we've got otherwise is these kind of certifications and verifications that the information is true. Um, and that's why, you know, the kind of decentralized and web frequent blockchain based solutions are quite revolutionary, I think, in 
the security and handling of information because they completely avoid this issue of holding data in one place, as Dario as mentioned. Um, and there's a strong disincentive for any hacker to hack into just my mobile account, to, to hack to get just my information versus a hacker in a big database where they can get lots of people's information. Um, to your kind of broader question, I think that as startups and as kind of businesses working in this pace and at the kind of forefront of change, we all have a big responsibility. Um, I spoke about how I think the human race and the human brain can't evolve as quickly as technology is. Um, certainly regulation lags behind the technology. Um, and so I think there's a, there is a strong onus on people working in space to kind of self-regulate as much as possible and to put pressure on the regulators and on each other to, to use best practices, to really you know, take responsibility and understand the implications of what we're dealing with and take very seriously the ramifications of what could, what could happen if that went wrong. Um, because ultimately, if we, if we just, just depended on GDPR, or just depended on the kind of protocols that were in place, you know, in a year's time, a lot of those would be out of date already. The technology has moved so fast, hackers move faster than, than that. Um, so, you know, if we want to make sure we, we're doing the best I can to be secure, it's, it's, on, it's on everyone uh, in this space to be responsible. Okay, very good. I think we've kind of heard a bit around the ethics and the security implications. What about the more social issues around incorporating technology? So, Mohammed, maybe we'll go over to you first. Um, you know, our AI systems are real substitute for interaction with a real human expert in this domain. So now, we you know, we're looking at removing the importance of humans in this loop. What are your thoughts? Uh, right. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, in regards to um, substitution of, uh, for you know, for interaction with a, a real human expert, I think um, the most important thing is that we should know that in a personal development process, uh, we might be dealing with uh, cognitive skills. We can uh, automate non-cognitive skills, but when it comes to cognitive skills, there are still many challenges for using AI and machine learning models and for training your models. So we are using a weak AI at the moment, not strong AI. So it's better to say that AI powered systems can be used for augment, uh, augmentation for the personal development process and learning experience. Uh, they can be considered as uh, efficient uh, assistance for learning, but they cannot fully replace a real human expert uh, uh, you know, in this domain, at least now. We can automate some of the processes, but when it comes to a proper coaching process, for instance, still we will need some insights and analysis from a, a human expert. Uh, so processes are not fully uh, automated. So I would say uh, there is a potential, but not now. But we should not be scared that you know, the, the coaches or the teachers and mentors are going to be fully replaced. Uh, routine, and the, the, the main reason that I'm saying this is that routine tasks and daily tasks and uh, uh, cognitive tasks are going to be automated, that's right, which uh, give the coach and the teacher and mentor more room to focus on cognitive skills and analyze and do more complicated tasks. So AI-based digital tutors have been created and used but as an experiment. So they haven't been developed to be used in the real life, at least now. Just a couple of years ago, uh, I think Defense Approach Research Agency uh, 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 sponsored a study that was called to uh, develop a digital tutor to copy the uh, interplay between an experienced specialist and a learner. So the aim was to uh, diminish the time spent by Navy trainees to achieve some high-tech skills. So the experiment revealed that when working with AI-based digital tutors, uh, you know, the trainees not only obtained the, the skills quickly, but also uh, overperformed the experienced experts. So it means that potentially AI-based tutors could replace existing experts 
the time uh, uh, and the learning process will be even more effective, but we need to have everything in, in, in place to be able to use a strong AI for you know, routine tasks and automation of uh, cognitive uh, tasks and uh, uh, non-routine you know, uh, cognitive skills. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Mohammed. And Debbie, what are your thoughts on this? Um, Debbie, you know, will AI reduce the need for that face-to-face -face learning, which we, you know, which has always been so important when it comes to education and other skills-based learning? Yeah, I think I totally agree with uh, Dr. Mohammed there because uh, again, it comes down to very much down to individual use case and applications because certainly there are. Uh, already successful applications, perhaps more are outside the training uh, with AI, where they are replacing the human uh, intervention. But uh, when it comes to training, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Mohammed that I don't think it is quite at that stage where it is able to sort of fully replace uh, that human intervention. That is why what we or where we're seeing are in, within our use cases is it sits quite nicely to be a complementary offering to start with. And again, um, like the other panel, panelists mentioned earlier, there are several aspects and concerns around the ethics issue. And I think unless we have more stronger regulatory uh, you know, def definitions um, as far as the use cases are concerned, um, I don't think we would get to that place where, where we would like to be. Having said that, I think uh, another thing is, is that where we see is AI helps very much to, to sort of simplify. At this point, it's really helping with the prediction, helping with prompting or making recommendations. So this is where it, it currently is very uh, popular, I would say, when it comes to the training offering. So yeah. Thanks, Tammy. I'd like to ask you all the same question, maybe ask for like a quick answer. Um, so Dario, we'll start with you. What, what are the challenges at the moment? <laughs> many. <laughs> As a quick answer, quick I would say many. Quick, quick answer. <laughs> now I'm going to be article. I'm going to try to articulate a bit more, Julie. So I think we saw security challenge. Sure, the other challenge is available data set. I mean, we are talking about a lot of the personal development is around confidential information, especially if we talk about coaching. So they are not available available data set of confidential information is a paradox by itself. <laughs> confidential can be so already yeah. find the data set is, is already a challenge. The other challenge is clarity of baseline and metrics to measure, measure personal development progress. There, there are not, we're talking about personal development. If we're talking about mental health, yes, there is, there is a functional person and non-functional person. But if we're talking about personal development, there is a lack of baseline there. And, and also who deliver the custom, the, the clients, who deliver personal development program, what we find out, they're not always uh, data-driven people. Okay. And why they're not data-driven people? Basically, the system, the system, and then support them with uh, useful data. So, so far, the system has support them with standard. And, and every, 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 every person that deliver personal development program realize that these standards are not one size fit all. And so that's, uh, that's a problem you see in education, for example, and uh, mm -hmm. all the standard in education and how much kids are kind of machine inside the education system and it doesn't work anymore. So what I think is that to, to overcome this challenge, first of all, you need the phase approach. And for phase approach, I mean, what, what the other panelists have said so far. So you start, uh, I would say you first start with mental health and support practitioner, not directly the clients, because mental health has a bias baseline. Functional people versus not functional people. There are tons of research around it. And then, and then you, you move into self mental health system and same things for personal development. At that point, you start from personal development platform support practitioner. You get reinforcing feedback from practitioner. And then you move into self oral development tools or virtual companions self oral development. So it's a phase approach. The, the, the other learning for us is uh, kind of focus uh, on human experience ultimately. So accept that when you deliver AI so, to solution to our customer, we, there might be errors. 
there, there might be tons of errors. So don't, don't face the customer directly with the for error, but just try to have empathy, humor, and, uh, and maybe show the pattern instead of showing insights that they have directly the error. Try to create empathy there. And, and, then, and then, I mean, there is a huge thing, so, and that's is concluded, is that I try to avoid prejudice assumption in the algorithm, but then I, I'm gonna open up the, the Pandora box of ethics and AI and all of that. One. But I mean, self-improvement model, we will need to get better at that one over time in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Dario. If there's any left. <laughs> so, um, Mohammed. Uh, any other maybe from an academic point of view is there any other challenges that are you know still in this domain uh, yeah thank you julie yes i agree with dario and i would like to add a few uh, more points to it uh, so as dario mentioned data is the biggest challenge so there are not many publicly available data sets which can be used for training AI models uh, that are uh, going to be used for personal development so any data related to psychology, mental health, personal development, coaching is really difficult to find. And the main reason is that you are dealing with personal data. So privacy and ethical aspect can become a, a, a serious concern. That's why most of the time conversational data sets or other type of data, which might be relevant to the field is used for training personal development AI powered systems. Uh, and you need to adjust the data based on your needs. So uh, another challenge is labeling the data sets, which is very difficult and time consuming process. So it's difficult to find a labeled data set while most of the issues that you want to address in this field are classification issues. So, uh, so this, this can be a really you know, a, a big challenge uh, for experts in this field. Another challenge is, um, which I think is one of the most important challenges is algorithmic bias. So if you are dealing with a biased data, it can damage the, the, the results or outcomes of your AI models. So if your data is uh, skewed to uh, favor a particular gender or race or educational status, your machine learning model or AI model may interpret this as a, a you know, determining feature. So uh, that's, that's gonna be a really you know, a big challenge. Uh, another important challenge is privacy and security. So uh, AI and machine learning solutions require a, a lot of you know, data to work effectively. So a lot of this data will have to come from your learners. Some of this data is private and, and should be treated as such. So this means applying all the required privacy measures and you know, adhering to any you know, relevant regulations. So uh, furthermore, I think none of this data should fall into the hands of you know, people who, who don't need to have access to it, whether internally or externally. Therefore, you, you should seek to take all measures that uh, you know, may, make your data secure. Uh, another big challenge is false information. Uh, so imagine that you know, to get the most benefit out of the system, uh, for instance, in an organization, employees should be encouraged to contribute accurate, up-to-date, and uh, truthful information. So you are reliant on, uh, on your end users to feed the machine uh, with the right data. After all, inaccurate data obviously will impact your results. So you should handle, clean, sort, connect, and, and share your data with care to retain its, its accuracy. And finally, I think the, the, the the last challenge that I'm gonna mention is transparency. So you should be fully transparent and disclose what data is collected uh, for the AI and, and machine learning models and what decisions are made with it. So if an employee in an organization is dealing with an AI rather than a human, you should let them know and you should tell them how the algorithm works. So uh, yeah, these points are you know, some of the most important challenges that uh, I wanted to add to whatever do you mentioned. Thank Thanks, Mohammed. We actually have a, a, a related question to what you just said last from the audience. So um, Tommy has asked about outsourcing is increasing exponentially. And what does the panel think of outsourcing human rights decisions to AI? Um, maybe Devi and Callum, what, what are your thoughts on that? Devi? Yeah, I think um, when 
Dr. Mohammed was mentioning about the challenges, certainly I completely echo the same, especially on the uh, the algorithmic bias as well as the uh, the data data security. But coming back into the bias aspect, why? Partly it's also because we humans are biased and we're biased every single day. Uh, and that itself is a major challenge. And uh, when these algorithms are put into place, um, as much as I wouldn't like to really pick on any particular gender here, uh, it is a very known and uh, information out there. A lot of these programs written, uh, mostly written by the male, um, male audience. And uh, uh, that clearly is, is reflecting on some of the outcomes these algorithms are generating. Uh, and these have, there's so many um, uh, news and incidents out there um, talking about these and uh, the implications of, of this bias. Um, so I think um, o o overseas um, outsourcing, um, you know, human bias is, is I think, is, is continue, will continue to remain a major challenge. Um, uh, but like I said, they're all gonna be quite connected in a way that uh, each organization have to work very hard in terms of uh, what, what regulatory measures and what the procurement measures and uh, uh, you know, uh, the ethical aspects of, of their programs and solutions. So, it is something um, we're all learning, we're all reflecting, and I think we need to reflect and learn pretty quickly to get this right. Uh, it is a, definitely a very serious concern um, yes. to be watched very care carefully and closely, yeah. Thank you. And Carla Manninson, you want to add to this one? And yeah, so I think um, regarding the human rights question, I think the fundamentally that comes down to whether or not there's a human in the loop um, in that process and we're talking about the bigger challenges previously I think actually and I think this is a very real risk and we're basically kind of in this situation right now is that we're on the precipice of losing control of what a lot of these models are doing in fact in some cases we may already have um, I think you know with, with how machine learning works inherently it's learning stuff by itself right and if if the outcomes of those analyses can be used to upskill the human learning process and they can understand and they can use that information to make decisions, that's brilliant. But if we get to uh, increasing dependency on these solutions to make decisions by themselves that we don't understand, I think that's very dangerous. Um, and I think, you know, I do think that there are situations where that's already happening. I think if you look at some of the big, um, Social media giants, even that you know, that serve billions of people, some, some, you know, most people, if not all people in that, in those organisations, won't understand fully like what the algorithms are doing. Yet they're making decisions every day that impacts societies and people's lives. And to me, that's that's very dangerous. I think that's very dangerous. Um, and it, it comes back to my point that technology will, if you let it, go faster than we can. But we have to accept that almost we're inferior in that sense, and we have to be have some humility almost and controlling it, and like you know, you know, we we can't keep up, so we're going to kind of we're going to stop, uh, we're going to slow down, we're going to pause, and we're going to catch up because if we just let it run, but we we don't know what we quite frankly we don't know what will happen. Um, and I think you know, it, as a in the commercial world and in the kind of capitalist and competitive world that we live in, actually there is a real danger that. We were racing to compete and be the first to market and then to have the biggest market share and all the rest of it and actually um overlooking some of these more important real human aspects in doing that is is, is a danger um so yeah back to that kind of human rights question i don't think we should create situations where we're wholly dependent on these technologies they should as, you know, as we've all kind of said in different ways they should be designed to augment human experience and human capabilities, not to completely replace them and not to make us completely dependent on them, um, especially when we don't understand really what's, what they're doing. Okay, thank you, Callum. I did have a, like a thought myself when you were talking. Um, you know, we've had discussions around how data is a major, the limitation of data is a problem in developing AI. And, 
yet we also have a worry that AI and machine learning can kind of get out of control. I, I, is, is that a limiting factor? Uh, maybe Dario, because you mentioned the issue of data. Is that difficulty of obtaining good quality data to build good quality models? Is that a limit to how, how far we can take this technology? Yeah, it, it's a limit, but it's also an opportunity, I think. What I mean is that, uh, yeah, there isn't a, a common perfect data set we can use to train each individual model. But that's enable also all different company, all different government to create their own one. Mm. So there can be variety. Of this. And maybe that, that can be also a solution to, to, to avoid bias because there are many different data sets that we use for training. So, so I think it's uh, definitely we see so it's, I, th I think it's, uh, it's never black and white. <laughs> I don't have a black and white answer to yeah, your question. I, know, I, I, know. I have, I have, a, I have, I have two, two, two perspectives here. On one side, I say it's limiting us a lot because we have no data set because information are confidential. And labeling, there is a, not a unique way of labeling because we are not in a medical space where there is functional and non-functional but everyone, every theory, every framework have a different way of doing that. So it's, it's a huge complex world. On, on the other side, I see the opportunity because, uh, so there is not a unified perspective, not a unified point of view. And, and so many, many branch can expand about that. One. And we will see, and we will, we will lead to a natural evolution to see the one that is, uh, is more effective, more user for, for society. So it's, I think it's more an organic way of seeing how is it will, evolve, will evolve AI and will benefit society in some sort of way. Thanks, Dario. I think we have time for one more. Um, Debbie, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, actually, um, just very quickly, because I'm mindful of the time. I think what I wanted to say is uh, the lack of the quality data, uh, especially in our case with the medical um, healthcare um, AI, is that it is actually slowing down the process, uh, taking it into uh, market deployment and scale because you have this critical aspect of validation, uh, particularly clinical va validation and uh, evaluation studies that's really necessary. And it's so reliant on the data sample. And if the data sample, the quality of it and, and the quantity of the data is, is not to the extent that it needs to be, and then I think we have a problem in terms of making it quite slow as far as we taking it to market. So that's where some business challenges, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. Everybody, thank you so much. I think that was a, I think we could have continued talking. It was a fascinating discussion. Um, I would like to thank all of our participants. Um, so Mohammed, Dario, Debbie, and Callum, thank you very much for participating. And I would like to say thank you um, to everyone who joined today. The next webinar is in a week's time. So that's Thursday, the 3rd of March. And the subject will be on hospitals, technology, and the patient. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. It's uh, my, my pleasure now to <clears throat> draw the meeting to a close and just ask you to uh, complete the survey, feedback survey, uh, when you when you leave the room. Uh, personally, I found the uh, discussion very, very stimulating. Uh, and one of the things that impressed me is not only the technological knowledge and subject matter expertise of our panel, but also um, a very consciousness, a level of consciousness about the impact on society um, and what it means to be uh, human. So I'm now going to uh, uh, close this session uh, and just say thank you once again for uh, participating. Um, the next session will be on uh, March the 3rd at 2 p.m. and it will be on um, hospitals, technology and the patient. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you.